Peter Anthony Dale Collier was born June 2, 1939, in Los Angeles, California. Like his close friend and longtime writing partner David Horowitz, whom he met while both attended UC Berkeley, Collier began his intellectual life as a New Left radical. In 1966, he became an editor at Ramparts Magazine, the left's most influential publication at the time, as did Horowitz two years later. Collier and Horowitz took over the magazine in 1969 and edited it until 1973, when they left to write a best-selling biography of the Rockefeller dynasty. Called by the New York Times Book Review the premier biographers of American dynastic tragedy, Collier and Horowitz collaborated again on a number one New York Times best-selling biography of the Kennedy clan. This was followed by epic biographies of other iconic American families. On his own, Collier went on to write a biography of Hollywood royalty, the Fondas, as well as a notable portrait of Gene Kirkpatrick, Ronald Reagan's ambassador to the United Nations. In the mid-70s, Collier and Horowitz both became disillusioned with the left, an intellectually courageous slow-motion odyssey which the pair recorded in their 1989 bestseller, Destructive Generation, Second Thoughts About the 60s, which made them enemies of their former comrades. While Horowitz became the more public face of their political apostasy, the more private Collier pursued an astonishingly prolific career as an author and editor, publishing works ranging from politics to biographies to novels to profiles honoring American military heroes, even short fiction, screenplays, and a children's book. He contributed articles to many prestigious publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Commentary, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Rolling Stone, Playboy, the New Republic, and the Weekly Standard. In 1992, Collier conceived, named, and edited Heterodoxy Magazine, the forerunner of the Freedom Center's front page magazine website, and also gave it its motto, the cultural equivalent of a drive-by shooting. It was a pioneer publication in the fight against political correctness. For the next eight years, said Collier of the groundbreaking journal, we attacked the world of PC relentlessly, fingering its villains and forcing them to do the perp walk. We named names, we ridiculed the fatuous, we constructed an intellectual CT scan of the malignancy that was spreading throughout high culture. Heterodoxy was funny and brash, it took no prisoners. In 1998, Collier founded Encounter Books in California, which became the premier publisher for powerhouse conservative thinkers including Thomas Sowell, Andrew C. McCarthy, Heather McDonald, Michael Walsh, and many more. As you, uh head for the library where you sit and read these books alone, these great books in Western literature on their own terms for what they truly are without the white noise of the PC classroom to distract you. Collier was the editor at Encounter from 1998 to 2005 when he returned to work at the David Horowitz Freedom Center, which he had co-founded with Horowitz in 1988. Under the leadership of Collier and Horowitz, the Freedom Center has become the right's foremost battle tank in the war against the anti-American left. Among other contributions, Collier edited DiscoverTheNetworks.org, the center's unique and invaluable online encyclopedia of leftist figures and ideologies. Peter Collier passed away in Sacramento, California on November 1, 2019, All Souls Day, at the age of 80, leaving behind a legacy of incalculable importance and influence on American conservative thought. Of his best friend, David Horowitz said, Peter and I were brothers in arms for over 50 years. We fought, we made up, and in the end, each of us filled in the deficiencies of the other. Peter was a generous and self-effacing man who preferred the background to center stage. His passing has created a hole that can never be filled. But he was a connoisseur of life and knew that time for all of us must have its end. I think that one of the reasons that David and Michael have had such success was the presence of Peter Collier. And I can tell you that I, I, I've worked with a lot of editors in New York, but I have never worked with a better editor or a finer person than Peter. And I was first introduced to him in 1998. I, I co-authored a book, Who Killed Homer? And UC Press would not publish the paperback because I was too critical of the field and they broke the contract and this man named Peter Collier called me up and said I hear you need a publisher 
And I said, well, before you do, we've attacked a lot of prominent people. He said, all the better. And then the next time I knew, he said, you wrote an article called Mexifornia. I think I could help you make it into a book. And he did. And then the final, I wrote a book two years ago called The Second World Wars, and it was getting out of hand. So I saw Peter and I said, you're the best editor I've ever had. I'd like to pay you to edit. And he said, that would be an insult that I would be take money from a friend. And I showed him the manuscript and he said, it's got to come down, Victor. And I said, Peter, it would be like cutting my arm or leg off. I've already written it. And he said, they've got gangrene. You've got to cut it. <laughs> and when I sent the manuscript in, the editors at Basic Books said, this is the finest edited manuscript. So I, I think that of all the attributes Peter had, one was his kindness and the other was his superb ability with the English language, and I miss him dearly as all of you do. Uh, I've been working with Peter now for almost 15 years, and uh, I don't want to talk, other people are going to talk about the, you know, the work and the writing um, and his great contributions to our, our culture and the conservative cause, but for me, I mean, the, the big, it's, it's, it's difficult and it's hit me much harder than I thought it would, is my personal relationship with Peter over, um, we became very close, we talked on the phone, um, at least once a day. I probably talked to him. I know I talked to him. I talked to David a lot, but I talked to Peter all the time. And a lot of it was work, and, and uh, Peter was, uh, as everyone knows, was an incredibly tough critic. Um, I would write something. He always edited everything. So I would write something that I thought, this is a really good letter. Peter's going to, it was hard to impress Peter. So I would send him a letter thinking, this is a really good letter. He would send it back saying, yeah, the, Mike, that was really good. And I would read the edits, and it was a completely rewritten, different letter. But it was really good. It turned into a really good letter. He turned. He could make everyone a great writer. Um, and I, I miss, but most of the time, when we were on the phone, is uh, we kind of had an order of things we talked about. And the Freedom Center was probably, you know, maybe eighth or ninth on the list. Our, our duties of what we needed to do, or to talk about uh, David, or who knows. But I, I won't get into that. But. Um, Number one was always, especially in the fall, was our fantasy football uh, uh, conversations about how his team did, how his players did, and we'd have those long conversations. Um, I'm a, a, a voracious reader of fiction, and most of the best, I mean, for the last, you know, 10 years, my best, the best fiction books that I've read have all been recommendations by Peter. He is, he's just always, any, anytime he gave me a recommendation, I would go on Amazon immediately, and I knew I was in for a treat. TV shows, movies, uh, Peter was such a part of the culture, um, and I just, uh, those were our kind of daily conversations, and I was always excited to get on the phone and talk to Peter. I miss him terribly, I, I really do, but, um, so I, that's kind of my, um, it's, it's, you know, I, I miss it. I keep thinking I'm going to call him on the phone, or I'm going to get a phone call from Peter. Uh, we're in the midst of football season, tomorrow's Monday, we should be talking about, uh, you know, who's, how our teams did. We made a couple of Super Bowl bets over the years, and, and I did win a few more than he did. I think he won a couple, but I still have the che I never cashed the checks. They were like $20 bets, you know, just for fun. Um, and I have a couple in my, from years ago, I have a couple in my drawer, and I couldn't cash them because in the memo section, he wrote something very special, and I won't, uh, it was two words, and it was, it was uh, you know, it was all in fun, but you can imagine it was not the, so I kept those, and I'll frame them someday, but, uh, so anyway, I, those are my, I just, I miss, I miss Peter. I miss him tremendously. Wally Nunn, who met Peter and David at the very beginning um, of the Freedom Center. Wally's been a founding board member. Um, and, and Wally really, uh, the center would not be around today uh, for not uh, Wally's leadership, particularly in those early years when he really uh, kept the center, helped keep the center going. So I'd like to ask uh, Wally Nunn, um, close friend, uh, to come up and make some remarks. Thank you. I first met Peter and David in, I think, 1987. Uh, he and David were uh, on a tour for Destructive Generation, and they had come to Philadelphia. And Dan Pipes, who I think is here, was running the Foreign Policy Institute where they spoke. And he invited my wife and I to go to dinner with him, and we went to dinner, and, and if you know Dan, you know he's a provocateur. He looked across the table and said to Peter and David, uh, you guys should apologize to Wally. He was a door gunner in Vietnam while you were doing your idiocy in the 60s. And uh, David was kind of quiet, but Peter started profusely uh, uh, apologizing. And I, I looked at them and I said, what you didn't understand was we were fighting 
not just for our freedom, but for your freedom. And I think I was a little more colorful than that about their freedom, but indeed, from that moment on, they adopted me. And I will forever be grateful because these were two intellectual giants, and what was I doing in their company? And I will forever, ever be grateful for that. Later, uh, after 10 years after knowing, 15 years after knowing them, I was approached by a, a, a Medal of Honor recipient, a General uh, James Livingston. I had happened to be in a battle with him in Vietnam, so knew him, who had an idea that he wanted to, that the Medal of Honor recipients wanted to do a book that would tell their stories. Uh, they had one problem, they didn't have any money. <clears throat> and they said, what can you do? And I said, well, I have a friend, let me call him. And I called Peter, and I said, Peter, do you know a young writer? As Peter was running Encounter Books at the time, so he, I figured he would know some people. It has to be good, but young, so we can afford them. And Peter asked me, what's the project? And I told him the project, and he said, I'll do it. And I said, Peter, there's no way we can afford to hire you. You're, you, know, you saw the New York Times bestsellers that he wrote. He said, no, 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 no. I'll do this for nothing. He said, I owe it to these guys. Peter spent two years, interviewed 130, the 130 plus living Medal of Honor recipients at the time, and wrote a, a short biography of each of them. That book went on to sell over 500,000 copies, which is a lot of copies for a tabletop book. Peter never took a dime. That book continued to spawn other things. It spawned a foundation. That foundation used Peter's stories to reach young people. And the way they reach it is by using the stories of these Medal of Honor recipients to segue into how young people need to understand that courage isn't just on the battlefield. Courage is something that we need in our lives. If we're going to have a civil society, we have to be able to be courageous. A whole, yes. And sure, you know, I was in Vietnam and whatnot, but what Peter and David did was just as courageous. They turned around and looked at their friends and said, you're wrong and we're going to fight you. And that, that courage is, was continued. In any event, an entire curriculum was created around David, uh, Peter's book. And that curriculum has been taught to thousands of teachers at this point. I see Diane Saylor here. She was helpful in, in getting us some of the financing needed to, to, uh, to do that. And she can tell you about the letters we're getting back from teachers, how this curriculum is helping young people understand that courage in their marriage, courage in their jobs, courage in their careers, courage when bullied, courage when faced with political correctness. This courage is what's going to bring our country and make our country free again and safe again. And we owe it to Peter because he's doing a really big part of this. I, and as, um, he also wrote another book, Choosing Courage, which followed up on the Medal of Honor using examples of courage from ordinary people like ourselves. I, I'll just leave you with this. In April, I saw Peter and uh, we were on the West Coast retreat. Peter uh, and I often would go off and just talk at these, these events because we, we had a lot of fun talking, and I could learn so much. Uh, and he turned to me on the way back into the building, and he said, you know, Wally, and this is just last April, when I'm gone, think of me, and think of our times. I always will. Roger Kimball is the editor and publisher of New Criterion. Um, he's the publisher of Encounter Books. Uh, he took over Encounter Books um, after Peter uh, retired from Encounter. Uh, he's an author, an art critic, and I have a longtime friend of Peter. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Roger Kimball. Peter and I must have met around then, <clears throat> certainly before 1989, when, when Peter and David's classic book, Destructive Generation, Second Thoughts About the 60s, was first published. But it was not until after Peter started Encounter Books 
1998 that we really became friends. My relation to Peter and Encounter can be divided into two stages. The first, following his founding of the publishing house and the publication of some of my own books, and the second, around his critical role in Encounter's transition to New York in 2005 when Peter retired and I took the reins. I well remember the frisson of anticipation that coruscated across the conservative firmament when Encounter Books was announced. Although Encounter was at first based in San Francisco, the main launch party, I, I think, as I recall, was in Washington, D.C. Uh, Tout Le Monde was there. All of the conservatives were there, and along with a cadre of skeptical press. Serious books for serious readers was one early motto, and the aptness of that tag may be inferred from the sampling of titles from those early years. <clears throat> and you'll find, a, you'll find a, a, a display table outside with some of the books that, that Peter um, brought into the world. Leaving aside my own book on the 60s, The Long March, uh, which Peter always referred to as the second best book about the 60s, uh, 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 which, which Encounter published in 2000. Peter published such classics as Mexifornia by Victor Davis Hanson, On Two Wings by Michael Novak, uh, The Prince of the City, a biography of Rudy Giuliani, uh, by Fred Siegel, Against All Hope, a memoir, of Life in Castro's Gulag by Armando Valadares, Diversity, the Invention of a Concept by Peter Wood, Heaven and Earth, a Brilliant Anatomy of Socialism by Josh Moravchek, who I think may be here, and Black Rednecks and White Liberals by the great Thomas Sowell. I suppose that Aristotle might have called Peter the efficient cause of encounter books. The material and formal causes came from the Lyndon Harry Bradley Foundation via the, Mike, the late uh, Mike Joyce, the foundation's director at that time, and his far-seeing colleague, Diane Saylor, who is, who is here today. Uh, Diane and Peter worked out the plan, the business plan for Encounter, and really made it, made it happen in the world. The final cause, as Aristotle would say, was, of course, to illuminate the most exigent political and moral questions of the day, and by so doing, to help change the world for the better. The history of Peter's association with Encounter, and of my intersection therewith, demonstrates the sly operation of what some might call coincidence, and others might call providence. Encounter Books was named after the English monthly, Encounter, one of a suite of intellectual magazines started after the Second World War with the help of an organization called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Encounter, whose founding editors were Stephen Spender and Irving Kristol, was always the flagship of this suite of magazines. All of these periodicals shared in broad outline an ideological perspective. They were ostentatiously liberal, but at the same time staunchly anti-Stalinist and anti-communist. Encounter's contributors were a who's who of contemporary writers and academics from W.H. Auden and James Agee and Kingsley Amos to Dan Daniel Bell, Cyril Conley, Arthur Kessler, Philip Larkin, Mary McCarthy, Nancy Mitford, Susan Sontag, C.P. Snow, Evelyn Waugh, and on and on. I don't know if anyone had a last name beginning with Z. Some of you may find it of interest to know a little bit uh, more about this history. In 1990, after my book, Tenured Radicals, was published, I was asked if I would like to edit Encounter. And I said, yes, I, I would. The longtime editor, Melvin Lasky, was nearing retirement, and it was thought that a younger man with my general outlook on things would, would be the ticket. I flew to London, met with, uh, with Mel and his publisher, and everything seemed to be set. There was just one catch. Encounter had been struggling financially for some years. The Bradley Foundation, which had suggested the scheme, was willing to help, but only if additional funds could be raised in England. Alas, the habit of private philanthropy 
is stunted in England as it is in, uh, in Europe generally, and the funds were just not to be found. So Encounter closed in 1991, and the Bradley Foundation bought the name and settled its affairs. But back up now to 1966, as you saw from the video, a young left-wing firebrand named Peter Collier had recently left Berkeley, where he was working on a PhD thesis about Jane Austen. I would love to know what he was writing about Jane Austen, uh, and joined the staff of Ramparts magazine. No magazine was more radical or more influential than Ramparts in its heyday. Specialité de la Maison were articles exposing the CIA's covert support for various seemingly independent enterprises. And in 1967, Peter was behind an article that revealed something that had been rumored but never documented, the CIA's covert support for the Congress for Cultural Freedom, and hence all those magazines, including Encounter. The revelation precipitated outrage on the left. My own view is that it was probably the best money that the agency ever spent. But those magazines, uh, those magazines, after all, championed Western values and open debate at a time when both were under concerted threats from Soviet tyranny. Many writers, however, disagreed. And they competed with each other to find the highest horse upon which to perch and denounce uh, Encounter and declare that they'd never write for it again. The Tempest almost sank the magazine, but it, it uh, soldiered on. So now fast forward to the, to the late 1990s. An older, wiser, more politically mature Peter Collier was tapped to take the reins of the fledgling book publishing company called Encounter. Peter ran Encounter, as you saw, uh, from 1998 till 2005, when I was once again asked whether I would be interested in taking on Encounter, this time a book publishing company not a magazine. Well, we moved Encounter to New York at the beginning of 2006, and it was then that my friendship with Peter really blossomed. This was stage two. We spoke nearly every day, sometimes several times a day, as he guided me through the Byzantine complexities and economic absurdities of the book publishing industry. He was an invaluable counselor and confidant a man whose judgment about matters personal as well as professional, literary and cultural as well as political, I trusted absolutely. Peter Collier was a serious man, but also a warm and joyful one. Anyone who knew him, and I assume that means most of the people in this room, will know that he was a vital personality and a good man and a true friend. <clears throat> This past decade and more, the question, what would Peter think about that, was often on my lips. And it is a great sadness to reflect that as no November 1st, 2019, answers to that question have been suspended. Requie Scott in pace, my friend. I will miss you. I always thought it would be Peter who would live to give the eulogy for me. Actually, I always wished that, selfishly. Peter was the eloquent half of our duo, and the one who had the greater empathy and appreciation for what another human being was like, where they were coming from, what obstacles they faced, how they had struggled to overcome, to, to overcome them, to get where they were. He was the one who knew what to do in situations like this. And that is only one of the many counsels from him I will miss now that he is gone. We were opposites in many ways, a yin and yang couple who butted heads at the outset and then grew closer and closer over the 50 odd years that we were together as brothers in arms. Peter used to say that like Donald Duck's nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, we completed each other's sentences. And also that we filled each other's deficiencies so that together we made up one whole person. Our first encounter took place 57 years ago 
When I was a teaching assistant in the undergraduate Shakespeare course at UC Berkeley, and Peter was a student, I had assigned the class a paper to compare Shakespeare's play, Richard III, with the film Richard III starring Laurence Olivier. As I was handing out the graded papers, I noticed a student, slightly larger than I was, coming at me with a body language that indicated he wanted to hit me. <laughs> it was Peter. I had given him a C plus on the paper. He was beginning to give me a piece of his mind when I took the pages from him and gave it a second look. I immediately saw that it had a literary quality that were never found in C or B papers. I told him to take his paper to the other teaching assistant and I would accept whatever grade he gave him. The other TA gave Peter an A or maybe even an A plus. Peter paid me back in the following way. That spring I was asked by the professor of the Shakespeare class to give the lecture on what is perhaps Shakespeare's greatest play, King Lear. There were 200 students in the class and I gave a lecture that was in its own way a performance. I thought it was the high point of my young career. The emotional climax of the lecture came when I quoted the tormented Lear's searing cry to the daughter he had wronged, delivering it like an actor. Thou art a soul in bliss, but I am bound upon a wheel of fire that mine own tears do scald like molten lead. After that term, I left Berkeley for England. Five years later, I returned to the States <clears throat> to take a position with Ramparts Magazine, where Peter was already an ed editor. And week after week, he would come around the corner of one of the cubicles in the office to mock me in a squeaky voice, oh, I am bound upon a wheel of fire. <laughs> <clears throat> Peter's childhood was a harsh one. So harsh he ran away from home in his teens. These origins left him with deep scars, a radar for unmasking hypocrites and scam artists, and the feeling that bad things were more likely to happen than not. As a defense, he shielded himself from incoming fire by keeping his private life private, almost to the point of secrecy, and by adopting a strategy of always expecting the worst, so that when the worst didn't happen, he could be pleasantly surprised. Peter's parents were Goldwater conservatives. What made him join us radicals was not any Marxist thesis, but the specific justice of the civil rights movement uh, in which he participated. And I would also venture that it had something to do with the enthusiasms of the revolution itself, in which he found a bracing and temporary antidote to his youthful pessimism. By contrast, I was raised in a progressive home which was infused with the arrogance of people convinced they were wiser than anyone else and on a mission to change the world. It was obvious from the outset that Peter and I were destined to clash a lot. He became my harshest but also my most trusted critic. Peter would frequently knocked me off my white horse to give me some life lessons. Lessons in humility that gave me a larger sense of humanity. I am forever in his debt for that. He never lost his skeptical eye or the radar he had developed to detect the self-serving motives of people who were convinced they were saving the world. This was the source of some tensions between us because I had been taught that ideas changed the world. I naively judged people by what they proclaimed. In my eyes, the Black Panthers were a political vanguard vital to the struggle we were engaged in. Peter had come to see through their posturing and regarded them as gangsters and kept his distance. He had also come to see the left as a political force driven not by idealism, but by malice. 
These views horrified me. But we remained close during our disagreements because of the bond of affection we had for each other. In the end, Peter was right on both counts, which I learned to my cost when the Panthers murdered our friend Betty Van Patter and got away with it, and when the left forced America's withdrawal from Vietnam and then pretended not to notice when the communists whose cause we had championed proceeded to murder two and a half million Indo-Chinese peasants. By the time I shed my radical blinders, Peter was already there. He wrote about the process of his disillusion in a book we co-authored, Destructive Generation, Second Thoughts About the 60s. In it, he summed up what the experience we had been through had taught us. Quote, the Black Panther Party, which had begun as a street gang, had never really changed. They had just allowed us white radicals to project our violent fantasies about vanguards onto them. They had remained a gang. The gang, it occurred to me, might be an appropriate metaphor for the left as a whole. In 1984, without talking to each other about the decision, we both voted for Ronald Reagan and became collaborators in our second act crusade against the malevolent left. By this time, Peter and I had written two bestsellers on the Rockefellers and the Kennedys, and were about to embark on a third about the Fords. It had been Peter's idea to write the Rockefeller book, whose pattern the others followed, and to write it as a generational epic modeled on the popular TV miniseries, The Forsyth Saga. He had picked the Rockefellers as a subject after re reading a notorious memo I had dashed off at Ramparts, the radical magazine we ran together. The memo described the Rockefellers' institutional empire, an entity that we radicals fantasized ruled the world. Biographies, however, are narratives about character. As a Marxist, I hadn't a clue about how to construct a family narrative or any real interest in doing so. But we had left our jobs at Ramparts and this was now our only source of income. Obviously, I hadn't thought through the problem, which at the time was just over my head. The Rockefellers and American Dynasty was based on interviews with the next generation of the family. It explored the challenges of establishing an identity under the umbrella of such a charged and famous name. I did the interviews for the Rockefellers. Peter wrote the book. Our collaboration was the beginning of an apprenticeship in which I learned from Peter how to write about human beings and not just theories and ideas. Before this, my writing style was described by Peter in his inimitable way as a Marxoid power motor sort of prose. <laughs> Under his tutelage and because of his example, it became what he called sinuous and even lyrical. I am forever in Peter's debt for carrying me through these difficult years following Betty's murder. When I found myself often wondering if I would be able to survive psychologically or financially. Later, I discovered a deeper debt when thanks to Peter and with his editorial oversight, I was able to write biographies of my own, of myself and of my late daughter, Sarah. I look on these as my best books, courtesy of my best friend. Peter's pessimism often proved a fallacy, a, a prophecy fulfilled. In 1978, he published a brilliant novel about the 60s called Down River. By that time, we had outed ourselves as conservatives, which was enough for the literary world, which had made us superstars, to turn its backs and dismiss us as extremists and other terms of political abuse. Peter's novel had the additional misfortune to be published during a newspaper strike at the New York Times, a standard setter for the book world. The blackout deprived Peter's novel of its audience, although it was probably doomed by the progressive blacklist in any case. P 
Peter was a large literary talent who never got his deserved moment in the literary sun. When we formed the Freedom Center, he found his niche in creating a pioneer publication in the war against political correctness. With signature articles like PC Riot and the 10 Wackiest Feminists, heterodoxy set an intellectual standard for the conservative counterattack on the radical culture that was being crammed down students' throats in our schools and universities. The masthead of heterodoxy had both our names as editors. We had become a brand by then. But except for occasional articles and suggestions of mine, it was Peter's brainchild. The concept, the name heterodoxy, and 10 years of monthly issues were his. As was the masthead motto describing the magazine as the cultural equivalent of a drive-by shooting. Although he continued to edit heterodoxy, for a seven-year period, Peter departed the center to create Encounter Books, a premier addition to the conservative publishing universe, which at the time was minuscule thanks to the cultural takeover of the industry by the intolerant left. When he had built Encounter into a cultural force, Peter returned to the center to be part of its brains trust and to edit discoverthenetworks.org our indispensable encyclopedia of the left. At this point, Peter received a call from Wally Nunn, who spoke earlier, a Vietnam veteran who had become our close friend and who we had made the first president of our board. Wally was heading up the Medal of Honor Foundation and had a project for which he was seeking Peter's advice. The project was a book on all the living winners of the Congressional Medal of Honor for their heroism on the field of battle, defending our freedoms. While he needed a writer to interview all the recipients and tell their stories, he explained to, the Peter, to Peter that the foundation did not have the money to hire an accomplished author and wondered if he knew some young writers who would be up to the task. Peter immediately said he would be happy to do it himself. While he demurred, we can't afford you, he explained. To which Peter replied, I'll do it for nothing. It was a project made for Peter to celebrate the heroes of our generation our, that our generation had attacked even as we took full advantage of the freedoms these warriors defended. Peter's own father was an exceptionally Amer hardworking American patriot whom leftists like us had betrayed. The Medal of Honor project was so Peter. It spoke to his moral sense, which made him feel guiltier than the rest of us for what we had done. His focus on the reality of individual lives risked and sacrificed for others. His determination to pay off the debt we had incurred by our thoughtless rebellions. Peter interviewed all of the recipients, wrote their stories, and completed the book, which bore the title Medal of Honor, Portraits of Valor Beyond the Call of Duty. It was a runaway bestseller. It sold 500,000 copies despite the cover price of $50 required by such a handsome coffee table volume. In accord with the arrangement he had made, Peter never saw a cent of the royalties. But as his brother in arms, and though he hardly mentioned it, I can assure you this was one of the most satisfying achievements of his life. A little over three months ago, Peter was diagnosed with a life-terminating leukemia. His doctors prescribed a course of chemotherapy to kill the cancer, which it did, but it also killed Peter, poisoning his vital organs and even affecting his brain so that he could hardly speak. Through his ordeal to come back to us, I talked to him almost daily, although our talks were mostly one-sided due to the medical blows he had suffered. He could get out the words, hi, Dave, but little more, little more than that. Nonetheless, mortally wounded as he was, I could recognize my friend behind the grunts and painful efforts to communicate. Right to the end, I harbored the hope that he would be able to fight through it 
and survive. Throughout his ordeal, his incredibly brave wife, Mary, was with him, negotiating with the doctors for his survival. Mary has been his partner for the 50 plus years I have known Peter, a wonderful woman for such a wonderful man. She was supported at his bedside by their three accomplished children, Andrew, Caitlin, and Nick. This was Peter's hard, hardest battle, and we lost him. My feelings, and I dare say those of all who loved and cherished him, were beautifully expressed by Peter himself in a eulogy he wrote for his father, which is part of our book on the 60s. Quote, as I sat beside my father in the hospital a few months later, watching as the last breaths were snatched out of his body, I had a feeling that part of my life was ending too. It was like those artist conceptions of stages of rockets separating. I could see my past decoupling from my future and falling away into deep space. So it is now with us. I take some solace in a Jewish perspective passed on to me by my daughter, Sarah, who died from a birth condition she knew would end her life before its time. When she lost a beloved aunt, her rabbi told her that some things are gone forever. You're not going to be able to touch or smell her or have conversations anymore, he said. But pay attention to the way your relationship continues. Sarah found this perception in a Jewish doctrine called the rolling of the souls. It was, she said, the idea of a spiritual reincarnation. The spirit of the one we have lost lives on in us. Over time, you can feel the presence of the departed inside you, guiding you. The conversation continue, that continues is silent. But it does continue. So it has been for me with my daughter, and so it is with Peter. I still wish it had been Peter up here giving this eulogy for me. But I understand the justice of the fact that I am up here doing it for him. Peter was a kind, thoughtful, generous man. He was also self-effacing, always preferring the background to center stage. A friend of ours described him as an absurdly modest man. In the end, he deserves someone as bound and indebted to him as I am to sing his praises and recall his precious life. He was my dearest, most brilliant, and most supportive friend. I love him and miss him and always will. Before the uh, Freedom Center was doing events at the Breakers, um, all those years ago, everything was run out of David's uh, uh, garage in a house in Studio City uh, with no budget, uh, without any staff. Uh, when they started uh, Heterodoxy, uh, Peter recommended what he always felt was uh, one of the greatest writers. Uh, you saw his byline up on one of those uh, graphics. Uh, Billy Servini was brought on board and uh, for Peter to say someone is a great writer is an incredible compliment because it, was, it didn't often happen. Uh, but Billy Cervini was at there at the beginning of the years. He now is a pastor and he's going to make some final remarks. It is an honor to be here. Uh, as, he, as he just said, my name is Billy Cervini and I am a Presbyterian minister. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, Peter Collier, my relationship with him as a very young man, changed my life. I was uh, 22 years old. It was 1992. I was an insecure kid that came out of college, but I, a couple years earlier, had just read this book called Destructive Generation. And what Whitaker Chambers' book Witness was to the post-World War II generation, Destructive Generation was for me. It literally took me down to the ideological studs and built me back up. In fact, it didn't just give me an insight into people with whom I disagreed, but it really forced me to take a look at my own heart. But of course, when you, like any young person, when you discover your political ideology for the first time, 
you become unbelievably obnoxious. <laughs> and you should be locked in a closet for a couple of years. So where does a guy like that go and get a job after college when you want to become a journalist? There's only one place where you can be loudly obnoxious. And that was at Heterodoxy Magazine with David and Peter. And uh, besides, they were the ones that started it. It was their fault that I was that way. So I figured they'd have to deal with it. So I sent a letter to David and uh, he hired me without ever meeting me. And within three days, I was driving across country to s help them launch this magazine, Heterodoxy, which was this subtle political magazine with a gentle hand. That's not true. It was one of the most aggressive things that I've ever been a part of. I, I still remember explaining to my mother why the first issue of our magazine had a picture of Karl Marx dressed in garter belts holding a bullwhip. <laughs> my sweet southern mother. But I met Peter during that time and I, he lived in Northern California. And my relationship with him, he was this iconic figure that shaped the way I thought and I was so intimidated by who he was and what he represented and I wanted to impress him. And our relationship was primarily on the phone and we talked multiple times a day and one day he gave me my first article to write. It was my chance to prove myself. I spent hours upon hours crafting every word so I could be impressive. I remember the, using a thesaurus to shoehorn as many $25 words in there that I could find. So I submitted the article. He emailed it back a couple days later after not saying a word and now I feel very less alone in this. Not one original word I had written remained. <laughs> I didn't care for Peter in those first days but, uh, because of that, but we spoke every day, multiple times a day. And I learned more sitting at his feet than I did in four years of college. It's true. And over time, our conversations became more personal. And I will never forget the day I called Peter. And I called him a few times, and he didn't call me back. And generally, that meant he was either playing squash or just didn't care. And uh, he finally called me back, and I could tell something was going on with him. And he proceeded to tell me that one of his children had come down, we been diagnosed with a serious illness. And he was devastated. And I listened to him as this powerhouse of an unwavering man, this, this iconic person who seemed to have a handle on the world, did something that really surprised me. You got to remember, I was 23. And he was in his mid-50s. He opened up to me, and he began to share his heart with me. This private man began to show me his fear and his weakness and his vulnerability in a way that when I walked in and listened to him, I knew I should probably take off my shoes because I was standing on holy ground. And we became friends, and it was during that season that Peter had rediscovered his faith. He began to walk in his Christian faith, and we had long conversations about God and who Jesus was and hope and grace. And during those conversations, in the middle of one of the darkest times, certainly where I knew him, I realized that he was surprised by something, that it was in the middle of the darkness that he began to experience hope. It was in our conversations, that in our connection, that but he began to experience purpose even when there was no resolution. There's a story in the book of John. It's in chapter 11. Jesus gets, gets word from Mary and Martha that his, one of his best friends is dying. A guy named Lazarus. And not only does Jesus not rush there, in fact, he stops and he waits three days before he goes. And during that time, he, Lazarus dies. Now, we all know the story, or most of us do. He ends up raising Lazarus from the dead. But Jesus goes, and before he does that, he walks and he stands into this middle of this crowd of wailing people, of people that are just devastated by the tragedy of this world. And in the shortest verse in the entirety of the New Testament, it says, 
Jesus wept. Why did Jesus weep? You see, because if I was Jesus, I knew what I was about to do. Right? I'd be giggling to myself thinking, I'm about to blow the collective minds of everyone within one mile radius of here when that dude walks out of the tomb. This is awesome. That's not what he did. He wept. See, the reason he wept is that in order for a God's divinity and power to have any relevance or toehold in anyone's life, that God couldn't just be entombed in stained glass. It couldn't be a God that just sits and flexes his muscles while he floats on a cloud listening to harp music. It needs to be a God that was willing to have skin in the game. A God that's willing to experience loss. That's the hallmark of this world. You see, Jesus didn't start in that moment when he walked into the Lazar by Lazarus' tomb. He didn't start by solving the problem. He started by dressing himself in it. Because he knew our hearts that we needed to be unalone. So that we could see on days like today when we remember our friend Peter and we experience the depth of that loss and that tragedy. That our pain and our loss in this world is not evidence of God's absence. It's the arena in which he moves. After I left heterodoxy, I went on a long journey. Not all of it was good. But I remember my conversations with my friend Peter. And I remember what he unknowingly taught me was that, hey, if you're waiting for the struggle be over, the battle to be won, for the pain to stop, you'll be waiting forever. That we have to find purpose in the pain. And my conversation with Peter cracked the door for me to see that if we're willing to look through the mustard seed of faith, if we're willing to step forward and let ourselves, and not just love, but let ourselves be loved in a way that we can see each other, the way Peter allowed me to do that with him, that there is glory in the ruin. There is beauty in the ashes. And in places like today, we can look back in the tragedy of losing a friend and we can say, it's still good because it was so good. And his accomplishments were many. But it is who he was that will endure. The way he loved his family, the way he touched my heart, the way that David and Peter walked together. Those are the things that endure. So today I thank God for the life of my friend Peter Collier. He was brilliant. He was courageous, but he was humble enough to be willing to let people in. And Peter, well done, good and faithful servant. I pray you are having a much-deserved rest from the battle as you fall into the arms of the one who has won the battle. I love you, my brother. Rest in peace. Amen.